imagine all life as you know it stopping instantaneously and every molecule in your body exploding at the speed of light. Total Protonic Reversal. Protonic Reversal. Protonic Reversal with your host, Kevin Neutron. Broadcasting from a secret underground lair in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. A gigantic middle finger to everything that is rock about music, rock and roll, and corporate power. The thing is, though, if you don't laugh, you're going to go on a killing spree with shot in the name of Confidence of a hero or a fool, I wasn't exactly certain which. Could not be more professional. <laughs> That's like a science thing, right? Yes, yes. Yes, yes, it is a science thing. It's a science place. It is a scientific fact. We are all up in your face. Welcome to the one, the only... Protonic reversal. Here we are. All right. So today is a great episode. Uh, Mr. Mark Lanigan. And been looking forward to this for a while. He's a very multi-talented individual, um, prolific solo artist, of course, uh, Screaming Trees in the 90s, Queens of the Stone Age, a little band called Queens of the Stone Age, perhaps you heard of them, uh, his collaborations with uh, Isabel Campbell and uh, Greg Dooley, a really interesting fellow, a new book coming out too, so really excited we got to make this happen. I'm a big fan. Uh, saw him do a solo show with my secret friend's bandmate, Tony. And uh, yeah, it's phenomenal. And I say that as someone that at the time, I, I really didn't even know most of the material. <laughs> it was just a really great show. Uh, and I've actually, it actually led to me to a much deeper dive into the catalog, which is vast and uh, which has a lot of different stuff to it. So, Anyway, really looking forward to this. Interesting fella, and should be a good talk. So we're going to play a couple songs. I'm going to play one of my favorite songs uh, off of the Mini Mark Lanigan solo records, uh, Bleedy Muddy Water off of the Blues Funeral record, and then we'll hit the, the, first, the new single, Stitch It Up, which is off of the Somebody's Knocking record, uh, the one that just came out, that also features a video directed by former guest of the show in front of the show Joe Cardamone and uh, Travis Keller is involved as well uh, friend of the show and former guest and I also want to give those dudes a shout out for helping make this happen because I've been wanting to talk to Mr. Lane again for a long time and uh, that's just a nice thing isn't it anyway this is uh, Bleeding Muddy Water I'm back with Mark Lane again after these songs
straight line Diamonds in the death mine Oh, baby, what this is this you love? us now is none other than the man the myth the legend mr mark lanigan hi mark hey man how's it going thanks so much for making the time um doing well it's uh snowy as hell in milwaukee right now so i'm I'm dealing but i imagine probably less so where you're at yeah i mean it's uh probably 75 today here in los angeles Slightly which is a little bit chilly <laughs> Slightly different, you know. This is this is Skosh. Uh you've got a brand new record. Well, new ish. Uh October, November or so it came out. And I should also mention that the reason we're talking in the first place is due to the um the help of former guests and uh, friends of the show and just friends, Travis Keller and uh, Joe Cardamone, both uh, great dudes that you made a killer video for one of the songs. I think it's one of the best videos that's come out in quite a long time, frankly, uh, which is the the one for Stitch It Up. And that was with the fella, uh, Jimmy the Cab Driver. Joe and Travis and my boys. Travis is Eastern Washington, so we basically come from the same neck of the woods. Same stomping ground, yeah. And and uh, he's like my, my uh, local photographer. In fact, he's taken some pictures for this next record I got coming out sometime next week. Um, and me and Joe have been working on some music. But anyhow, you know, we had dinner at our house, and Joe met Donald for the first time. And since I put out my records on my own label and then licensing to uh, play them in Sam, I'm responsible for, you know, all the costs, which is why I have a studio in my own house, so I don't have to pay anybody. Right. But also, also for making videos, and it was a really terrible year. I didn't have any money. And I just asked Joe. I was like, "Man, f- I hate to fucking ask you this, but <laughs> you think you can make a make a video for me? Doesn't have to be anything elaborate." And he just said, "Jimmy the cab driver." Yeah. I was like, "Oh man!" <laughs> I, I, I was like, "I can't ask Donald to do that." The first role he ever had, you know what I mean? Cause right, right. Like, a, <laughs> <laughs> like from like a dog's age, yeah. <laughs> but dude, I, I asked him, and and I prefaced it by saying, you know, don't kick me in the balls. Just, you know, feel free to fucking tell me to fuck myself. And the moment I mentioned it, he got so excited. He was so into it that it was just, it was incredible. He threw himself into it. He loved the idea, and all of that shit is all just straight off the top of his head. I mean, Joe set the scenes and, you know, put me in the clothes, but everything Donald says is just like, you know, 
just riffing. Yeah, it totally seemed like he was just, you know, doing doing his thing, like being in that character. You know, the update, of course, is being it's, you know, like an Uber or like Lyft kind of situation rather than a taxi. But if anyone's familiar with that character, it's like, oh, yeah, it's just it's he's doing the thing. And it's, and it's the first time that I'm not going to say the first time that uh, I've paid any attention, like what he's been up to in a while. But like I, I was I was surprised by like, yeah, this dude was like kind of like a big part of growing up. Uh, you know, I love those bits. Those bits were genius. So, like, it it's like you get the bonus of having a cool video, and then you also get, like, a little Donald Short, <laughs> Jimmy the cab driver, coming along with it, which I thought was a just a really, like, cool and kind of, like, interesting move, especially because I'm a, kind of a fan of the video as an art form. And I feel like, like, think back to, like, Thriller and stuff like that, where they had, like, a whole little mini movie and stuff that would happen before the song would even start. And I feel like that's kind of well, yeah. fallen by the wayside now. So I thought it was a really, I thought it was just really cool, I guess is what I'm trying to say. It's, fall, it's fallen by the wayside because there's no longer record companies that will pay $100,000 <laughs> to have uh, have me walk up to, to a helicopter as it takes off and kicks up dust in my face 20 times in the day like they used to in the 90s. Yeah, well, um, Vincent you know, Price is not going to be in the budget. <laughs> You know, like it's <laughs> Ab- absolutely not. And I did. I had to do another video too. I hadn't done any videos. But I hadn't, well, I hadn't been in any of any videos for my songs in like fifteen years. But I had to be in this one because those guys were doing it. And then uh, after that, I was like, "Fuck, you know, this was cool." And then I had to do another one. And so I went back to like a real, you know, old school, you know, big time director that I've known for 30 years who did, you know, a video for my band, the trees in the nineties. And then he did the Queens, uh, no one knows video. In oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I forgot. Yeah. 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 He's been D car. He's also, he's also a Washington dude. Same as, same as me, Travis. And, um, and so I, I had to go to him and say, Hey man, again, you think you can put something together for free? And he's like, fuck, you know, cause this is a guy who used to get paid yeah, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars to be, you know, Manson and fucking everybody. And, uh, and he was like, you know what? We're just the two of us going to go out to salt and sea and I'm going to fucking take still photos. And he took like 3000 still photos and put it together. And it looks like a video. Yeah. And it really, it was totally killer. Well, and so, oh. the interesting thing about that is the Salton Sea is such a unique and bizarre place anyway that, like, it's got a real cool kind of cinematic feel just because of the locale. Oh, yeah. Dude, that's... I mean, I'm not, I'm not a fan. <laughs> <laughs> I, w- I wouldn't go there on vacation, let's put it that way. <laughs> oh, oh, no, no. It's, it's, it's great to visit even better when you leave, as they say, right? <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, well, Dean, Dean, Dean was like, we're staying for two days. And I was like, dude, we're getting this done in a half a day. She's like, well, we'll see about that, you know. <laughs> and we get we get to our hotel, like the nicest hotel in the area, late at night, the night before we going to start shooting. And the guy says, don't mind the crickets. And I was like, huh? I open up my fucking door. My room is not filled with crickets, but it's filled with like locusts. Oh, my geez. my fucking hotel room and Dean's were filled with these gigantic grasshoppers. Oh man! <laughs> so I, I just like we had to get up at five anyway to like start shooting. So I we got there at like two. So I just like sat on the couch and fucking you know watch the grasshoppers jump around. Yeah, I mean, what but are you going to do? Like eight. relax and go to sleep when you got like. <laughs> Freaking uh, yeah. an Attenborough video going on around you? No, man, come on. <laughs> yeah. So and we did end up fuck, and we did end up shooting it in half a fucking day, and and getting everything we needed and left. So my prediction was correct, but I think he was pretty happy to get the fuck out of there too. Yeah, it's it's <laughs> that's a that's a unique place, but yeah, not some place you want to spend an extended period of time if you don't have to. I would go ahead and say. Yeah, well, it's great if you like dead fish and dead birds. Yeah, that's smelling. And a huge man. and a huge piece of water that's like a sewage, you know, treatment plant, <laughs> like a, the size of a giant lake. 
<laughs> yeah, I mean, the, the the thing that trips me out about that place is that, you know, I've heard that, like, like it won't exist. You know, it's just going to be gone, like, in the next, like, 60 years or so. Like, it just, like, but it's it's just this weird, bizarre piece of kind of like Americana from, like, a, you know, from, like, a bygone era that just didn't work out at all, like, how they planned. But it's going to just disappear off of the earth eventually. And, like, you know, within my lifetime, anyway. Well, a lot, a lot of things are going to disappear. Yeah, well, yeah, I guess we're going down that road. Good point. This, this earth could disappear during our lifetime, in my opinion. But yeah. You know, if you put it that I, way, I, I guess. Always, I just felt that way. <laughs> it, put, it kind of puts it in perspective, for sure. But, yeah, so you casually dropped. So this is the the two songs that got the videos the, off, the, off the latest record, which uh, came in the fall. I know you, I saw, was lucky enough to see a play in Chicago. It was a great show. I guess probably just shy about a year ago, like it was in the spring sometime. I don't remember. And, you know, you played some songs off of it, but you dropped also that you have another record coming. This is, this is going to be with the book, right? It's like a companion piece almost. Is that, am I right in, on that? Yeah. They, they, I mean, I had like three weeks before I was going on tour and the record, this record in October wasn't even out yet. But the guy who bought the rights to the book in the UK happened to be best friends with the guy who puts out my records there. And he thought, hey, wouldn't it be great to have a record to go with this book? And I'm like, um, well, I'd have to write some songs really quick and record it really quick. And also, like, you know, get a bunch of people, <laughs> like <laughs> every one of my friends, to play for free. Yeah, get people to play. And so, <laughs> but that's what happened. And I, you know, called me every one of my friends to, to play on it and I only had Alan Johannes for 10 days he's the guy who usually engineers all my stuff that my wife doesn't do because she she runs Pro Tools in my house as well and I, I actually recorded quite a bit of this record myself too but um, but yeah got it done and it's uh, it's, it's it's pretty weird it's it feels like, like maybe the most honest record I ever made in, in a weird way really so like, I'm, is, is, I'm kind of Stripped down, you mean? Like, how do you mean honest? Like, just lyrically? Like, what do? You... Uh, um, it's just you know, a song isn't real. It's it's uh, okay. it's a it's a uh, you know, sort of a, a fantasy land uh, version of life, I guess, or a slice of you know, a moment, a dream, whatever. But these these songs were directly linked to the book, so they were all of them like for the first time ever were actually about a oh. specific thing or time or person. Oh, I get you. Okay, cool. And that had never happened to me before. I mean, I, all my songs like kind of start in some form of reality, but then they take a hard left into, you know, weirdness town. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's, and that's something where, well, it's interesting that you were able to correlate it with the book as well i said did you find that kind of informed like the direction of how the songs even sounded uh, as as opposed to just like the what they're about well they asked me they asked me to make something that was like the record that i started making like my fake leonard cohen imitation records <laughs> that i nice. began making 1989 yeah, and yeah. um i i couldn't do that but i said i would like have elements of that but also I would have the elements of the stuff I do now, which is electronic stuff. And, yeah. and it, it ended up having, you know, all of that. And it totally, you know, went together. Like there's one song that I did all on these crazy little synthesizers that do basically whatever they want when you push a button. And I had like <laughs> all five of them that I have going and then just put like a drum beat to it. And then next, then after that, there's a song with just acoustic guitar and like uh, you know a string section. So it was uh, it's pretty varied, but that was the payoff of the book. You know, I was talked into doing the book by a couple of friends of mine who were best selling authors and who you know were urging me to write a book for quite a while. And you know, they'd said, "Oh, you're going to get this cathartic you know experience out of it." And, Honestly, I didn't get any of that. It was more like opening a Pandora's box of fucking <laughs> shitty memories. Oh, man, and, that's rough, yeah. <laughs> but, the pay, but the payoff, I realized the payoff was these songs because they 
as soon as I was done with the book, I, you know, I, I, I'm kind of a compulsive worker. I, I get up every day and I, I do something. Uh, and the first thing I do is work on music usually. Um, of course, the book took up I don't know, four months of my time, but uh, as soon as I was done with it, you know, I started writing songs, and and they, these are the songs that became this record. So I already had like, you know, maybe half of it, half of it in the bag, and then the other half I had to write really quickly. So did you? So the the one that just came out was that, I mean, obviously it took a while for it to come out, but was it like a different kind of process where, you know, it took, took a while for that to be composed and recorded or, um, and I'm asking because I wanted to see if it was, was that like a contrast, like having to kind of turn this over fairly quickly, uh, with the last one, or was it, you know, kind of just how you operate now since you got your studio at home also? Well, the last couple of records I made, were kind of specific exercises and just doing stuff that I hadn't done before. Sure. And um, I found this guy who had asked me to uh, put some some lyrics and vocal parts on some of his music a couple of years, maybe three years ago now. Oh, uh, there's, yeah, yeah. There's a guy named Rob Marshall. Yep. And... Um, and he, uh, his music, you know, I didn't know who he was or know anything about it. It was a new band. And, He's a humanist. I liked the music. humanist is his band, right? If I remember correctly. Is that? Yeah, that's, that's the name of his band. And it's, uh, it's just him with a bunch of different singers. Um, I think I sing on more of it than anybody, but then he and I had this relationship because, I did three songs for him, and and then he just before I did, had talked to him, it was all through my management stuff. And that's the only criteria I ever use, you know. If I like something and I can hear myself on it, I'll do it. It doesn't really matter who it's for what it is. That's just, I just you know dig dig doing stuff that I like, and and I liked his thing, and it was really easy to write to, and. Um, so after I was done, he sent me an email and said, I really thank you so much. I dig this. And if you ever need anything, you know, if you'd, I'd love to do some songs for you. And I was like, oh, yeah, you know. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> <He's still there. laughs> um, like, yeah, yeah, yeah all right, sure, dude. <laughs> um, and, uh, and then it came time to, I was coming down to, like, I had two weeks left to finish this record, and I had, you know, about half of it that I liked, and then we had been trying, um, and I to do this other type of thing that kind of turned out to be sort of out of my grasp, mm -hmm. and it wasn't, turning, it wasn't turning out the way I liked it, and I thought, fuck, you know, there's this guy, I just remembered, uh, he said, if I ever needed anything, give him a call. And uh, I had two weeks before Alan was going to go on a, like a two-year tour as part of P.J. Harvey's band. Oh, Christ. So I had to get it. Yeah. I had to get it done then, you know. It was like Nothing critical. like a deadline. <laughs> Jesus Christ. And, uh, and, and he immediately sent me like eight pieces of music and six of them, like I immediately wrote you know, lyrics for and sing parts for and it turned out to, you know, be uh, along the lines of what I was wanting to do anyway. Oh, nice. So I that ended up being the record before this one that just came out in October. But then he and I continued writing songs for that humanist project because we just, uh, you know, found that we were like a pretty good team, yeah, songwriting wise. I mean, <laughs> and, and so we so we were writing songs for other guys to sing, and uh, at uh, some point, he he suggested I make a double album, and that was something that I had tried to do twice before, and ended up being like a long record with 
you know, an EP. Right, right. I couldn't pull it off because it's a lot of work. I found out. <laughs> well, yeah, it's it, it's hard to make a fucking long record great, you know. And I I try and shoot for greatness. I I rarely hit it, but you know, um, some double I know records, when it's not great. Some double records kind of don't really justify their existence as double records, and you kind of wish they were just a single record that was better. <laughs> Well, yeah, I mean, like, you know, there's fucking great, great double albums, but it's been, you know, like when I was a kid, uh, Double Nickels on the Dime, The Minute Man. I just and, talked about uh, what, and I was, I was marveling about how that record works, you know, it, it really works, even though it's kind of stylistically a little all over the place, it's, it's like a perfect record, I love it. Exactly, and Zen Arcade. Yep. And these guys were, you know, these guys were Who's to Do and Mintman. They were on SST when when I first signed with them. So, you know, those were the guys I looked up to. My first two tours were opening for a while. First one for 100 bucks a night. Second one for 200 bucks a night. <laughs> hey, you doubled, you doubled your earnings, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it was just enough, just enough to pay for gas from play, to get us from place to place. Yeah. And then what? And then what would like still bum rush our one motel six rooms, and take up one of the whole beds to himself, and never offer to help pay the sixty five dollar bill. <laughs> Jam <Classic. on> <laughs> Yeah, we, yeah, absolutely. And he still is. But he's he's you know he's great. I learned a lot from him. Um, but anyway, yeah, I had. I tried to make a double album a couple of times and once I felt like I got close, but then it was just, just wasn't happening. Well, this time around, I not only wanted to make a double album, but I also wanted it to be filled with like the catchiest songs that I had, mm, you sure. know, like, like the kind of record I had never made before. Like every song, in in my world, in my mind, could be a radio single, that kind of record. Sure, okay, and, yeah, yeah uh, I get you, yeah. And so I, you know, did a bunch of it with Rob again, and then I have another guy that I write with a lot, guy named Seats, and then Glocum, Dutch guys played strings with me, live and on my records, and uh, between the two of them and Al, you know, we uh, we put together a record that I felt like did the trick and that's what I put out in October well this other one which is fulfills my uh, contract with having me the one for the book um, it also ended up being a double album it's a totally different kind of record it's the kind of record that me and I used to make before I started you know trying to make these uh, <laughs> these these Hit records, <laughs> and, and I, I say that I say that tongue in cheek because I, you know, yeah. obviously none of it's ever going to be a hit. But the, the records that I, yeah, yeah, <laughs> I, 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 I get where you're coming from from that. Uh, and uh, so we went back to you know me writing all the songs myself, and and uh, it was a lot more enjoyable for him. I know that because he's a big part of what I do. Yeah, and well, and it's it's cool that you you know that you have the, uh, the the different kinds of records that sort of represent the different kinds of moods. I mean, all the you know the first you know six records or so, you know, I've, I I know you don't play that stuff very often, but it sort of like kind of seems like very much like of its time. So I would imagine like you want to stay focused more. Like I personally. <laughs> For my money, I think Blues Funeral is, is a goddamn un, underrated masterpiece. I think that record's amazing. That's that's my best record, in my opinion. It's and, got everything. Uh, I mean, it's it's got it all. Like <laughs> it was also it was also eight years between records. I'd been doing like a bunch of you know I made like six records in that eight years, but none of them were you know for me. That was the easiest. I, it was unplanned. I, I was fucking, uh, I decided I didn't want to do music anymore. Mm. And I was doing, I was doing another job in television and, um, 
and I got an offer to do a trailer for a video game, and it was, you know, pretty good money, so I uh, got together with Al, and we got the job, and we, you know, did the song, and and then we just fucking kept writing and recording, and I, I would write a song, and while he was working on it, I was writing the next one, and I wrote just enough songs for the record, and it was also, it was it was just the funnest and most uh, fully realized record I felt like I had ever made. And also, because it had been so long since we'd made a record, that, you know, I didn't, I didn't give a damn about, like, you know, anything. It was just like, right. I'm going to make this exactly the way I want to make it. And, you know, whatever the record company thinks, fuck them. Because I, when I first signed with Beggars, they thought they were getting the guy like who made Scraps at Midnight, you know? Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. And it's... <laughs> But what's so it's interesting. Yeah, yeah, the sad disco, which I love. But uh, it's so it's funny because like the whole vibe of the record, it has a different feel to it. Like it's not that it feels like easy would be the wrong word, but it feels very like just comfortable and like I think it lends a, an interesting vibe uh, on that record that again almost akin to like a double nickels or something that you can have like some some sad disco songs as well as like some you know more like kind of raucous like rock and roll numbers and it all kind of sits very nicely with each other and has a good feel and you know it feels like it it flows thank you yeah and it actually was my my most successful record like in the real world and then in 2012 that was kind of you know that was that was pretty late in the game to be selling a lot of records because it, you know, <laughs> right. shit, shit, had, shit had already changed. You know, there was already like two generations of people who were streaming shit. But yep, and that's, that was uh, yeah. It's 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 it. It, it kind of makes you wonder, like, what would have happened if that would have happened like sooner, right? But you can't think that way. Yeah, fuck you know. I've, I've never lived off of record sales. I've always lived off of the advances, you know? but now you know, those don't exist either. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, I but, mean, it was 20, 20 years after I made my first record for Sub Pops that I finally got a, a royalty check. And that was after I had been off the label for 15 years. Oh man. Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, no, I, I, I'd, been, I'd been off the label for like 10 years before I got my first royalty wow. check because I was on the label for 10 years. Yeah. But but that was, you know, them giving out like, you know, 100 grand for a record. Crazy amounts of money. Yeah, different then, times for you, sure. You would never recoup. You would just live off the advance and make the record as cheaply as possible. But those days are done as well. Now you have to tour continuously and sell merch. That's, Yep. It's the whole game. It's uh, it was a friend of mine just described it as uh, setting up a, a pop up Etsy store all around different <laughs> cities every night <laughs> while you also happen to play music. <laughs> yeah, it's weird. At some point, I realized my real job was like shaking hands and taking pictures and signing shit because I go to the merch table as soon as the show's over, you know, because I see the bread is buttered. And- yep. And I, I developed this because that's kind of unlike me. At first, it was great because it was like, oh, man. You know, I hadn't talked to not even like one fan probably for the entire 90s. I just wasn't, you know, an inner actor. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. Now, now I'm out there, you know, meeting everybody. Yeah, it doesn't really seem your vibe called. necessarily. From, I mean, if you don't mind me saying <laughs> it doesn't really. Uh, do you yeah. find, is it cool, though? I mean, do you find that people have, you know interesting things to say or like people are great i mean you know most for the most part people are beautiful and they often have really touching stories uh about the way the music the way they're connected to the music uh sometimes they're really sad stories um but it's it's all really meaningful and uh i mean i've not been 
as a, as a human being, you know, like the greatest person <laughs> in my life. But, but I had the, but I had these songs, you know, that like, that some people connected deeply with. And, right. and I felt like this was then, you know, this was like me being told that by these people. And it was, um, it was, it was a great gift. And also it put me, you know, in, into, uh, into the world, you know, if I had to interact with people. So it was good for me. But after a few years of doing it, I developed this fucking ghost pain in my wrist from shaking hands. And I thought like I'd torn it. I thought I had torn a tendon. And I, I actually had my road manager take me to get an MRI on my wrist and there was nothing wrong with it. But shaking hands, it was like this is excruciating pain. It's like and carpal tunnel or something. Like what? <laughs> that's what I thought, but it was just, it was just fucking all in my head. It was because shaking hands with people. Wow. It's something that's not, I, I'm not necessarily like a real touchy feely kind of guy. You know what I mean? Yeah. 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 And here right. I am shaking, shaking hands a hundred times a night. Um, but I convinced myself that there was something fucked up with my wrist, but it was really just something fucked up with my brain. So what do you do? I do you go goofy it. foot and like change the other hand or something? Like, why do you, what do you do? I, I did, I did. I just, you know, go for this, for this bump. There's this, you know, the way, you know, guys fucking go for that college handshake. that's sort of like part high five. Oh, right. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I refuse to fucking shake hands like that, and guys guys try to do that shit with me all the time, and I just bend their fucking wrist down to a normal handshake. <laughs> it's so classic. I love doing it because they they come up you know with their hand up like that, and I grab it and just like practically break their wrist and make them shake hands like a normal human being. But um, then they get a lesson and a story, so you know, hey, it works out for everyone. <laughs> the the best. The best is when guys want to take the picture uh, with you, but they want to have it taken while you're fucking shaking hands. Mm -hmm. And, and dude, when you do that, their wife sits there and fucks with the camera, so you end up holding this grown man's hand for fucking, like, <laughs> a half a minute to a minute. So, so I know that, you know, whenever they fucking, like, hey, now can we, you know, when they try that shit with me, I say, dude, I'll take a picture with you, but I'm not going to sit here and hold your fucking hand. And... <laughs> And they never think I'm an asshole for it. They just feel like an asshole for trying to make me do it. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. Great. It gives them a little epiphany of uh, self awareness that, like, oh yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, like I'm gonna sit here and hold your fucking hand for a minute while your wife fucks with your camera. No. <laughs> oh man, that's sorry, funny. dude. <laughs> that's just not me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's hilarious. I so yeah, I noticed that you know you you, you mentioned that, and I noticed that. Um, you get a very the show I went to, and I didn't hang out afterwards at the show I went to because I came down from Milwaukee, and it's a goddamn hour and forty five yeah. minute drive, so I wasn't hanging out afterwards. Uh, but I noticed that there was, you know, there's some some younger folks there, but you know, the good good amount of folks that uh, were very engaged, but kind of like of a certain age, you know, a lot of people there, yeah, with wives or whatever, and um, it seems like they've that like the crowd's kind of grown with you in, in a lot of cases. Would you say that's accurate? I would say that's not the case in the States. What you're talking about with these older people are people who are my age, but look like they're 20 years older, probably. <laughs> at least that's my, at least that's my, they either look my, older or the they look younger. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, one but, but when I see those people, that, when I see those people that look 70, I realize that they're probably my age, you know, 55. So, um, Some of them yeah, have that's, pretty that's hard lives. I, I, that's why I don't play. That's why I don't play too much in the states. It's you know, it's I've never I've never cultivated an audience here that I can sustain a living from. And um, my band are all European guys because right. that's where I play. And over there, my records chart, you know, in like in countries and uh i play you know big shows and sometimes well every summer i play large festivals and a lot of people don't even know who the fucking screaming trees are there but yeah. if i play here 
I played, in fact, when I played in Milwaukee a couple of years ago, I was pretty sure it was like all elderly Screaming Trees fans. Like people that were there from back when you guys played. <laughs> Yeah, that's like the last time I had been there, you know, since like 1992 or whenever, you know? Yeah, yeah. Oh, man. And yeah, well, it's understandable. I mean, if you got, you know, when there's when your audience is in Europe, you're going to spend your time in Europe, right? I mean, that's that that makes sense. But I, I did think it was a cool show. And one of the reasons, one of the things I thought was really cool about it is I actually kind of, you know, on the drive back, I did a count. I tried to figure out, like, the set. Well done set, by the way. Like I, I felt like it was like you pulled from a lot of different albums, uh, not so much from like the first six, but like I thought it was you know very well rounded. Like how do you how do you decide what to favor? Obviously, you got the new record. You're gonna you know gonna play the single, but how do you how do you favor what stuff you're gonna play? Especially when you don't have any and again air quotes hits at least in the in the U.S. Well. You know, that's not exactly true. I co-wrote the Queen's biggest hit, the top ten hit. Well, uh, sure. No <laughs> I'm not <laughs> I'm not trying funny. to denigrate you in any way. I'm just saying, how do you, like, I mean, just, there's I'm a lot just, of songs. I'm just kidding, bro. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Of course, I don't have any hits personally. Um, the only time I've ever stumbled into, like, you know, the real world, it was by accident. And that only happened twice in 35 years, so... Um, how I do it is I focus on the new record. I choose like maybe five of the songs I like the best from the new record. And that would include, you know, whatever singles have been released. Yeah. And then, and then I go to the next record back and I play my favorite songs off of that. And then I go to Blues Funeral and play about half of that record. And then I go to Bubblegum and play a couple songs off of that. And then I pretty much leave it the fuck alone. Yeah, it's a pretty good set at that point. I'm, well, I mean, when you have, I don't know, I guess this record coming out in the spring would be like 12th, maybe. It's it's a lot of records, and I'm not gonna I'm not gonna play like you know acoustic music with a rock band. It's just not. <laughs> That's a good point. Not yeah. what I do. Yeah, yeah. And uh, the, those first records were heavily acoustic um it doesn't mean i don't like you know field songs is one of my favorite personal personal favorite records but you know i i just don't like going back that far i pretty much like trying to stay in here now yeah. although I, I am aware that there are songs that people you know really want to hear so i try and throw a couple of those in do you but feel it's you're just in really like such a different place that it's just kind of harder to connect with that or you just kind of feel like the newer stuff has more pop with the band or what's what's the psychology with that well i mean i'm i'm just i'm not into playing something that's 30 years old really i mean unless, <laughs> I guess it is, huh? unless, unless it was by somebody else that i really like you know i mean i'll play a cover from any period of time if i like it um and there's nothing more fun than playing covers but People don't necessarily connect with the covers teams, you know. Um, but uh, you know, it, it's a fine line. I, I'm I'm really not one of those people that really cares to the audience. I don't I don't interact really with the audience unless they make the mistake of calling for a screaming tree song, and then they're <laughs> going to get they're going to get a bit of a talking to you, but. Um, you know, it's just, uh, I'm, I basically do it to please myself. And then if other people connect to it, and some people do, that's the icing on the cake. And, you know, I'm aware that it's also how I make my living. So, you know, but I, I work really hard to make every record as, as good as I can for me. And then I've realized that some people are going to enjoy it and some people aren't because that's just yeah. the nature of music. Yeah, you can't get caught up trying to forecast what people are going to like or make yourself nuts and probably make crappy music in the process. Yeah, and also, say you you know, you know hit on some fucking shitty song that people love, does that mean you're going to play it for the rest of your life? <laughs> <Right>. Not <laughs> if you do. Yeah, exactly. I, 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 I'm never playing, you know, I'll, I will never play Nearly Lost You and never have since, you know, whenever I quit the trees. 
because it's just, you know, not my cup of tea. Yeah. Yeah, and it's it's it, well, it was interesting, you know, coming at from perspective, you know, as of a fan as well as a musician. Like I kind of didn't really know about your solo work until Whiskey for the Holy Ghost, and I sort of listened to it without knowing that you were the dude from the Screaming Trees. And I was like, oh, this is cool. Like I dig, I dig this. And then I was like, oh, it's that guy. Oh, interesting. And then I was like, oh crap, he has like all this other stuff. And like it was. I guess it's harder to explain again for the younger folks that listen to the show. But I mean, there was a time where you couldn't just instantly get all the information about an artist immediately. And I don't know. It's not like it was necessarily better or worse. It just was different. Right. Well, when I was a kid, look to the fucking racks of tower records just to buy whatever looked interesting. Yep. Yeah. My first job was Tower small. Records, and that's what that's what was like the perk of it is like I actually got to listen to music that I you know try stuff out, find new shit. Nice. Yeah, I worked in the warehouse for a chain in Seattle when I first moved over there, and uh, that's where I got turned on to like Nick Drake, Tim Buckley, Leonard yeah. Cohen, all the stuff that like that informed those early records of mine. Totally, because you know? that has a, it, it has a similar ish vibe, but it's like your take on that. And you know, well, it, was, again, it was me trying to imitate it, <laughs> right. but, but, <laughs> but, it sounds but, like but you know, I recorded that. I recorded my first solo record two months after I first learned my first chord on guitar. So it was, it was a bad imitation. I actually ripped the fucking total melody and phrasing from Suzanne, which is one of Leonard Cohen's most famous songs on my first solo record. And nobody, ever said anything about it. All right, like, well, now everyone's going to go look for that and uh, report back, I guess. But, uh, <laughs> you know, what, what's that movie title? Even Dwarf Started Small? You know, <laughs> <laughs> you made up for it. Let's put it that way. And then I, so, you know, flashing forward, and also I'm going to bring it up just because you mentioned it, like something that I, you know, obviously not just I, but a lot of people really caught notice was, Stuff you did, Queens of the Stone Age. I, you know, the rated R record, I think, is so fantastic. And In the Fade is probably one of my favorite songs from that band, which is in no small part due to the incredible performance that you did. Like, how did, was that, what's the process like with, uh, you know, with, with Josh and Company? Like, what's, it's obviously a, it's a rock band, but it's, you know, it's different from doing your own stuff, I would imagine, right? Yeah. And from my, like- 96 until we like officially broke up. He actually played the ranch we did. He wouldn't let me do it by myself, which I thought was cool because I didn't really want to do it. But it was a lot of money. So I did do it. And uh, he had asked me to be the singer in his new band, Cruise the Stone Age. Okay. Wow. And, and, uh, and I said, well, play me some of the songs. And when I heard him singing it, I said, dude, you have to be the singer in your band because, I mean, it, yeah, I can I can do this, but this is this is so unique the way you sing it, and uh, and so I, I turned it down. Um, plus, I was like, I think I was like fucking institutionalized for almost a year. So I, I, I couldn't really get out to, to work on it. <laughs> yeah. but, Logistical <laughs> concerns, right? <laughs> yeah, it, the timing wasn't great either. But <laughs> maybe, maybe I wouldn't have done it. But I did tell him, you, you need to sing these songs. And um, I think that was pretty good advice. But by the time the second one came around, you know, he was like, Bob, yeah, we do this. So I ended up singing, you know, harmonies and on a bunch of it and you know wrote in fade with them and then that record really took off in england and that you know put them on the map yeah and they and they got really popular there really quickly and their last tour of the uk they asked me if i would go along and uh you know as like the guest singer and so they could do that song and some other ones from the first record that Josh didn't, couldn't hit. <laughs> right. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, like, 
walking on the sidewalks and some of that crazy shit. Well, and, some um, some of the ones are not necessarily made to be sung and play guitar at the same time. To, not to put too fine a point on it, you know. And it's also it's not a bad thing to have in your back pocket, like someone who has like authority as a singer, for lack of a better term. You know, like <laughs> like that's not that's not bad. No, no one's going to be sad about that. Yeah. So during that tour. Uh, you know, he asked me, you know, to, to join the band and his vision for the next record was Nick was going to sing a third of it. He was going to sing a third of it. And he wanted me to sing a third of it. And I thought, well, it's kind of a weird idea. Um, it, you know, it was my first real time of like, you know, walking on stage and doing, you know, three songs and then that's it. It, yeah which was you know it, it was it was like it was like being a fucking closer you know in high school when i would come on the pitch if we were ahead in the last inning of the game i had to be on from the fucking drop but when you're a singer you can kind of work your way into a set unless of course you're the guy who's just there to bring the darkness and it's coming on halfway through you know what i mean you yeah, gotta yeah. fucking nail it from the so, but that was easy for me. I, I, I grew to enjoy it too much. And, uh, you know, the next record was a lot of fun because Josh and I wrote a lot of it together and then, um, wrote a lot of the next one together too, which I thought was an underrated record. It uh, is. Lullabies. Yeah, I think that's the one that um, kind of people forget about. And that's, uh, I think that's a shame because I think it's, it's got some really great tunes on it. It's got a good sound, good feel. Yeah, I agree. But also that's kind of in, you know, that version of the band um, was falling apart. And um, I left, Nick left, I came back, I left again. <laughs> and, and, <laughs> you need a revolving you know, door. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then, and then that started, that started like that eight-year period where I was making records with other people, you know. I made three records with Isabel Campbell. I was got her twin records. I was just gonna mention both of those records and, and like way to put not to put a final point on a way different vibe on 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 the especially the Isabel Campbell ones. Oh yeah. I mean and, and me and Greg had been like working on it for ten years on the Gutter Twins record because we only like got together every Christmas and record like two songs, so but um, I also made two two records with this band uh, that was kind of like electronica at the time um, from Britain called Soul Savers. So I, I ended up making like six records during that eight years and touring on all that stuff. Um, but also that was kind of just like, that was also not really... You know, I mean, I co-wrote the Gutter Twins record with, with Greg, and that was fun. And I wrote all the, you know, singing parts and lyrics uh, on the originals for the Soul Saver stuff. But with Isabel, she wrote everything mm. with me and mine singing it. And it was a it was a fan of her music beforehand, but I had never had, like, you know, a woman, like, write songs specifically for me to sing. And that was a real, it was a gift and it was really, it was a unique experience which I'll always treasure. Um, it was one of the funner things that I've done. But, you know, all that stuff had to come to an end because really I was not, I, I was just not working to my, you know, to my, the full extent of my ability. That was all kind of like, you know, part-time shit. It was like, money money gigs and you know stuff with friends and uh i mean i i enjoyed the hell out of the gutter twins record because greg's my best friend yeah yeah but uh, which had a cool vibe and it was slightly different from <laughs> it, it you know it obviously had a through line through it, but it was slightly different from anything either you guys had done either but it made sense well, that, i guess it's the best way to put it like it, it totally like was sounded cohesive but it was slightly different it had a different vibe well that's what we that's what we said going into it was if 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 one of us is doing something that is reminiscent strongly reminiscent of something that we had done before 
the other guy has got to call out the other dude and say, dude, you're, you're doing something you've done before. Right. So we, we, we policed each other like that. And, um, and also that record, we were both like in, you know, some pretty deep darkness during a lot of the making of it. And for me, it ended up sounding like our version of there's a riot going on. That's the only record I can yeah, yeah. I can um, hear that. Yeah, yeah, know. yeah. I, get, I, I totally get that vibe. Yeah, yeah, I didn't. I never would have thought of that on my own, but I totally get that. Because it's, there's, there's like a, there is like a, a, a slightly positive vibe to it, but the, it's so dark. It's, it's like, you know, it's like a terrible Coke party. That's what, it's the only record <laughs> that reminds me of. It. There's a riot going on. <laughs> well, yeah, because it's it's a lot of times when you have um, records like that, they you know maybe they'll get part of the vibe, but they certainly don't like you don't get a lot of dark party vibes out of, out of most records these, these days. Or if they, if they no. exist, I don't hear them. Let's put it that way. Yeah, exactly. So I, I I'm really I love that record. Uh, I don't know if we'll ever make another one again, just because. I mean, Greg always plays on my records, and I sometimes play on his. But uh, it's it's fine when I'm going in to do something for him, and he has you know a distinct you know something in mind for me to do, and I do it. And when he comes and plays on my records, I tell him what to do, and he does it. But when we work together, it's uh, it's it's a bit. Uh, it's a bit more complicated and um, we have two to- totally different ways of working that don't really mesh <laughs> in that way. How, how so? What do you like? You mean from a compositional standpoint or recording or like, what's the dish? Um, I guess is what I'm asking. <laughs> both ways. Just, we, you know, we have like, we have two different ways of doing stuff. Okay. I, I'm very sloppy. I'm fucking, um, I don't care if there's like, you know, some fucking white noise from oh. the lights or something mm-hmm. in the studio. And and I also like to, I like to make things pretty minimal. I mean, it might not seem that way in my recent records, but I'm not somebody who likes to pile on like every instrument in the book. Mm. But, but Greg likes to, you know, utilize every instrument in the, in the studio. And Get that glockenspiel. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and, and, but, then, but then to his credit, you know, then he'll, he'll take it apart. You know, he won't always just leave it that way. I mean, he, he, he just, he tries, every, he tries a lot of different stuff. Whereas I'm like, okay, that, that one take is fine with me. I'm good enough. You know what I mean? I'm good. And, um, He's just more meticulous than I am, and that gotcha. okay. is that, that means I spend a lot of time in the studio. And the only studio that I like to spend time in is my own because it's the only room in the house where I can smoke. Uh, <laughs> anybody else? Anybody else's studio? I'm paying a lot of money for it. <laughs> you got to smoke so outside, cute. buddy. <laughs> making making records old school, and that's the way Greg still makes them. He just made a beautiful, like a solo record mm-hmm. that I think is the greatest record he's made. Oh, wow. Um, and, I mean, I thought that the, the first, uh, well, the, the two, uh, when, the, when the Wigs reunited, those two records were amazing. Yeah. I thought a lot of the stuff, the Twilight Singers was great. Obviously, the early week stuff is great as well. But this record, I think, is a masterpiece and it's his first solo record. But, Again, you know, he's working in the fucking, you know, studio, old school. Yeah. For shitload of money a fucking day. And Ain't cheap. Of course, he owns, five, he owns five bars and a couple of hotels, so he can afford it. But I have to make my records for free. Yeah, yeah. Well, we, yeah, it's, it's, that works great for him, but we, we don't all have that same, that same option, I suppose. So you, I mean, but you know Greg from like way back, right? Like, where did when did you did you guys cross path like for touring or like how did you how did you end up meeting in the first place? Um, well, we met when he said hello to me in a bar in Chicago, and I thought he was clowning me 
And for years, I had like this imaginary beef in my mind where <laughs> when I saw this guy again, I, I was going to kick his ass. And I didn't see him again. I didn't see him again for like 10 years. <laughs> But I was always on the lookout for this guy because I, I found out who he was and I thought, like, this guy's like, who is this guy? You know. Yeah, what's his deal? <laughs> who the fuck does this guy think he is saying hello to me? You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> and, and, then, uh, and then through mutual friends, we were both living in Los Angeles in the late 90s. Um, we got together and, and just fucking hit it off immediately. And, you know, after like spending 10 years always on the lookout for this guy that I was going to pay back for <laughs> clowning me. Right. You know, he became the secret best, beef. He yeah. Became my, he became my best friend and, and, you know, gave, gave me a place to live when I was fucking homeless, you know, let me live in his house for free and always let me stay there when he was gone to take care of his cat. And, you know, he's, he's, we we talk like once a week, but it's a phone call. When I see that he's calling me, I realize I'm gonna have to. It's gonna take at least an hour, hour and a half. Because you, you know, you're gonna be tied exactly. up that long talking to each other. Yeah, that's great. Because I was gonna say, because the vibe with with uh, those records are, is this that you guys are like you know brothers from a different mother. So it's it, I've always been kind of curious as to. You know how did how did that develop? So it's all the funnier saying that you had secret beef with him for forever after a misunderstanding. <laughs> yeah, like from 1992 to like 1997, I was like, <laughs> and I was always on. I never saw him one time. Never ran into him. <laughs> <That's> amazing. <laughs> and then when I did it, it turned out we were like practically. I mean, we're like two sides of the same coin. We right. have a lot in common, but we're we have two totally different personalities. Um, but we we fit together, you know. He's he's just that dude in my life. And you know, and you know Josh from uh, Screaming Trees, right? Because I mean, post post Caius, didn't he like play? He he like played in Screaming Trees for a while, right? Josh played in the Screaming Trees from age twenty four to age 29 five years I, I mean we weren't the, the last two or three years of that we weren't you know really playing yeah yeah it was kind of broke already but uh, but yeah I call that breaking I up in slow that, motion I, <laughs> I know that when he was a kid he, he was he said he was three with music and uh we knew the bass player in the trees and we were looking for an extra guitar player. And he said, uh, you know, he knew this guy from Caius and I was, I was a fan of Caius. And I said, get him. And, uh, you know, they, they had already rehearsed and shit by the time I met him. Um, but then he and I became really close friends. But by that time, the, the rest of the band, nobody liked each other. We were just going through the motion. Yeah. And uh, he brought, he was like the only guy interested in talking to me. And we spent, uh, you know, he became my, my pal. And we're so close. Um, we, uh, we go out to lunch, we go out to the movies, we do shit like that. And, you know, we're, we're old men now. We still do this stuff, so. Right. <laughs> no, nobody wants to kick each other's ass over the course of like a seven-year period or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, he did once threaten to kill me once I got him into like wow. a bit of a jam. Well, he, he when he was young, he had a fascination with my uh, lifestyle mm. that was, you know, a bit uh, over the top. But uh, he he just was he wasn't interested in journeying in with me. He just liked watching the way I operated, I guess. And uh, insisted on going out with me in some town, you know, where I'm trying to score. Like, I think it was Rockford, Illinois. We were on Law Prison. It was all these right. backwater towns where it just wasn't easy to fucking, you know, score drugs. Yeah, fucking Rockford, thing. Jesus. <laughs> and, and, uh, and he came along with me, and we did, you know, get into the hood. But what I didn't realize was that everyone 
that we ran into thought he was a cop. <laughs> 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 he, looked, he looked like he was. He's got he the look. Like he sure. Of, yeah. He, he looked like he was straight out, straight out of the fucking police academy. And so he got a, we got, you know, a shotgun pointed at him, and <laughs> all kinds of shit happened. <laughs> and we got back to the hotel. He said, he said to me, if you ever do that to me again, I'm going to kill you. <laughs> oh, my God. That's so funny. I, I, said, I said, fair enough. You know, I was 33. He was 24. <laughs> yeah. And it's, you know, it's no no fault of his own. He's just got that look. He, you know, he's got that kind of, you know, was it like a linebacker in high school? You know, it got into the force. He's got that, totally has that look. I never thought about it. But, it's, oh, my God, that's hilarious. Yeah. And that was just the mere, like, you know, five or six years after his high school football career that he was out walking the streets with me. So he still, yeah, he, he was very young looking. <laughs> I mean, that's terrible. I shouldn't be laughing, but eh, no, fuck it. I'll laugh. It's pretty funny. <laughs> oh, man. So, so speaking of back in the day, do you ever talk to the Connor brothers anymore? Like, the- have you kept in touch at all, or is it just? I've had one conversation with Lee Connor in whatever the twenty years that he's not been in the band, and it was a fun conversation. It was a long lasting phone conversation. He and I were never, uh, what I would say, friends. <laughs> right. So, so... In fact, you know, we had a uh, uh, what's the word? contentious or yeah contentious uh, contentious relationship yeah it's from from the drop and um you know when i when those guys asked me to fucking join the band i was just singing songs that he wrote i didn't know shit and but i knew that i didn't enjoy the the lyrics i was singing and i also didn't enjoy singing songs that were written so far out of my range that it gave me a headache to sing them every night. But I also was from this tiny town that, that I'd always wanted to get out of, and this was my opportunity to get out of it. But at some point, after I had learned to write songs, um, it was our second record for Epic, because we, we signed with them while it was still hair metal days. It was pre oh, the sure. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's, hard, it's easy to forget about now, but that was, of course, yeah. Jesus. Um, <laughs> I blocked they, my they memory, were, I guess. <laughs> and they would have usually dropped us right away had Nirvana happened. But suddenly, like, it was, you know, Epic really wanted another record from us because, you know, Seattle was jumping off. But I had a solo deal and I was getting ready to make, I was making Whiskey for the Holy Ghost, which had quite a large for the time uh, advance attached to it and that I didn't have to share with anybody and you know we had made like all our records for SST for a thousand bucks a piece so I knew how to make a cheap record um, and so I wasn't interested in making another record with those guys where I sang songs written by somebody else and I just said you know what I, I can't do it and that was a big disappointment for them because there was, you know, a, a pretty hefty advance attached to that record as well. Plus, the opportunity was there for some sort of, you know, coattail success. Sure, yeah, of course. Seattle. So, um, yeah, that that didn't go over well. And then they called me back and said, uh, yeah, if you, if you come and do this record, you can write all the lyrics. We'll write all these songs together, you know, because before that, Lee Connor had just written every song himself. He was like a, I mean, he could, he could write three or four complete songs, a four track demos a, a day. Oh, with lyrics. <laughs> That's he, pretty productive. With, yeah. <laughs> I mean, he was, he was a machine. I mean, not getting that. He was a fucking, he was a genius in a way because of that, I mean, his work ethic was in, insane. And he had full fucking, you know, lyrics. But the problem was that they were already fully embedded in the song and they were always hooky too. Catchy lyrics, or catchy singing parts, but with terrible lyrics. 
it's impossible, impossible to like impossible to change because they're you know to try and change something that's phonetically you know already in the song and yeah it's like at the, the core rhyme, of the song the yeah. rhyming scheme everything about it you know you just can't do it and believe me I tried many times and <laughs> failed every time so uh, when when I was finally handed the reins we had our only successful record. I'm not saying it was because I was handed the reins. It was obviously because of the time frame, um, you know, the, the period of time, the Seattle thing. But it was satisfying to finally make a record that I could be proud of with those guys. And I was also proud of the last record we made with them, which I thought of as more of like the way I think of my solo records. It was more of like, a, I think of my solo records as like, uh, uh, but I think of them as like art pieces, you know what I mean? Because the, I always have like a different idea for every record, and they might not seem that different to the, you know, the the. No, I get it. The casual listener, but I always have like a different thing that I'm trying to do. Which again, like back to this record I put out in October, it was a specific thing that I wanted to try just because I had never tried it before. And um, that's the way I think of that last Screw and Shoes record. I thought it had a lot of great songs. It was really difficult making it. Uh, band was fractured, deeply fractured, mainly because of me. But um, I'm proud of that one, and I'm proud of the one before it. The first whatever 20... I mean, the first six <laughs> records. The, the first six record. I first six records I was on are probably amongst the six worst records of all time. So I don't know if a guy would get a chance to to do that these days. You know, be able to make That's a, a bunch point. of terrible records and learn. You know, publicly learn how to fucking make a decent <laughs> record. Might <laughs> be publicly humiliated anymore. <laughs> yeah. Well, well it, there was a lot of that, yeah. and it's crazy because if you just think about, you know, artist development in general, not only isn't a th- isn't even a thing anymore. It's more like you are expected to like you've got one shot, go, and like it, if it isn't just amazing immediately, boom, people are onto the next thing immediately. It's cr- it's it's crazy to me. It's like the downside of it being, you know, whatever comes out, it isn't just what comes out that week that it's competing against. It's like all of music throughout all time. So yeah, I feel bad for when artists are kind of just getting going that they, you don't have an opportunity to suck at first anymore. <laughs> you just have to got to hit the ground running. Right. I mean, yeah, you got to have your shit together from the drop nowadays. I, I, I would never have survived it. Yeah, I was going to um, say, I did not have my shit together either, so I think, I think there's, all, there's, there's something to be said for, you know, for for being of that time. and also, But also, like you know, like you mentioned, like, you know, if you go to Europe, like, no one's, no one cares about, like, Screaming Trees. They're looking for that. They're looking for, for your stuff, because that's what they know it from. And it's, it's interesting to see how history kind of remembers some things and doesn't remember others, like some stuff's down the memory hole, <laughs> you know, for good or for worse. It can be yeah. interesting to see what what connects and what lasts with folks. Well, I I got you know some breaks in in the UK, which is you know still uh, I I did the math and I played I played to you know somehow like I, I've averaged like two to three shows in London a year for like twenty years, wow. which I don't even know how that's possible. Wow, but that's if I counted like all the times I played, I played there more than anywhere else because that's where my largest market is in the UK. And a lot of that was due to the Queens, and a lot of that was due to Isabel Campbell. Sure, yeah. Both, Different crowds, too. Um, so you know, people know me from something else, it's, it's probably from one of those things, but um. Yeah, um, it doesn't break my heart if people don't remember screen trees. Um, I certainly don't think about them too often. Yeah. Well, and as far as you know, trying out trying out different stuff and and doing different things, like I think you've got a pretty like you got a pretty good catalog. I mean, we talked about how you don't you know you you don't 
necessarily aren't in the same place as you were then for the first six records or so, but those certainly are, you know, some, some of those records are totally killer. It's just that I could totally see, it's, you know, it's not necessarily where you're at right now. And uh, you, how do you divide the line between, I guess, being an artist and entertainer in that way? Well, much like Freddie Mercury, I was obviously born for the stage because entertainment is my middle name. <laughs> Mark Entertainment Lanigan. <laughs> yeah. Dude. I, I realize there there is some, some fucking you know, some artifice to this, but I'm uh, I'm the furthest thing from an entertainer. I've been asked to like, you know, play with some pretty heavy dudes, join bands that they're so inappropriate for the kind of singer I am. Yeah, yeah. But I, I, but you know, it's flattering. Of course, it's hap- It happens less nowadays that I'm in my older years. But you know, I've been asked to fucking join some some guys who fucking have sold millions of records. But I just, I was like, dude, do you not see that I'm not that kind of singer? Yeah, I don't move. I don't fucking you know I'm not an entertainer I'm the fucking I'm the guy who just stands there and sings and um, so I've, I've been I've been lucky to just you know have any sort of career really with my lack of dance skills so what I will say if you don't mind me interjecting here is having seen you play last year with um, my bandmate we both agreed that you know, you have a way of commanding the stage that it's not like you're doing the, uh, you know, whatever, the fellow from Iron Maiden that's always running around and, <laughs> and um, I can't, get, Dickinson, Bruce Dickinson. You're not doing a show like that, but you got like, you got a presence to what you do that makes it an entertaining show somehow. Like, it's sort of like, it, it, it doesn't make sense in the tra- traditional sense of like, it. for instance, for me, it takes a lot for someone to be someone that stands there and sings. But I think you got it, man, and it's and it's you're very comfortable with what you do, which I think is underrated in music. And uh, I don't know, it's it's not something to to denigrate or uh, look down upon. I think it's actually kind of amazing. It's it's a, a rare talent. So I mean, a bunch of people can run around like Iggy Pop. Doesn't make it Iggy Pop. I appreciate that. Um... Yeah, when I opened for the studios in Greece, like uh, when Watt was playing bass for him and Ron and Scott were still alive, and I, and I knew Ron since the 80s. He was, uh, like, I got off stage at St. Andrews, and some guy came up to me and said, hey, man, somebody wants to meet you here in the back. And I was like, what? Who? And he's like, oh, you won't you won't be sorry. He <laughs> 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 in the back of the room, and there's Ron Ashton, and he says, I just want to tell you, man, I really love the show. You have the energy of the Stooges. <laughs> Fuck yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> which, which is the same, which is the same thing that Cheetah Chrome said to me when I met him in Bloomington, Indiana. After a show, he came busting through the door and he said, "I just wanted to tell you, man, you have the energy of the Dead Boys." <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing. Oh, it's so cool. <laughs> Yeah, it was cool, but I, I I just I didn't remain friends with Cheetah, but I did remain friends with Ron, and um, you know we became pals and talked on the phone, and you know whenever I was in Detroit, I would see him, and so it was cool when that Stooges reunion happened, and I just happened to be in Greece opening for him, but I was as I was watching him, I was like it was a stage that was like came up to about my chest, mm-hmm. and I was. I was like the only guy on the side of the stage, like kind of leaning on the stage. I'd you know, just flown in from London that day to Athens. I was burnt. The smoking ban had just gone into effect in London. I'd spent like three hours in Heathrow with no... I was like, what? You can't even smoke in Heathrow anymore? But um, I was like, as I was like leaning on the stage, I noticed that Iggy kind of caught, caught a side of me. And started making these circles, like, ever-widening. And I thought, he's going to kick me in the fucking head because, <laughs> I'm, because, because I look like I'm just, like, you know, resting on the stage. Right, like right. I was. I was like, like, what's this dude, like, sleeping on my fucking stage while I'm doing the show? And I thought, and I just, I just had this epiphany, man. He's about to come kick me in the fucking head. And I got <laughs> 
I got the fuck off of there really quick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, we talked about when I had Watt on. We talked about you know him joining the, the Stooges and how he just like totally focuses on Iggy and how Iggy like how he does the show is he you know it's like almost a show for each person. Like he's just so hyper focused on all of it, so it doesn't surprise me at all saying that. But yeah, I can see the, I can see there being clear and present danger, uh, knowing, <laughs> knowing him the way that the way that he does what he does. That's that's potentially like a red line situation <laughs> to, to look like that. I, I I was glad that it occurred to me because I thought you know, like wait, he's getting closer to me and. uh and I look like I'm just some dipshit. He's like sleeping on the stage here, not really giving a fuck about the show. You know, I think I'm, I think I'm pissing you off. I better get the fuck out of here before you get in the head. Gonna get on his list, and then 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 game over, man. <laughs> so but yeah, that 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 was a, that was a big moment because they were great, and then. Um, and then you know I was a huge fan of the Williamson stuff too, and of course I yeah. got to meet, I got to meet him, and uh, he did a record of some of the demos that him and Iggy had yeah. done, and I got to sing a song with Alex and the Kills for that, and that was a lot of fun. James was great. Yeah, that's a trip where he was just you know out out of the life for like a really long time, like had a straight job, didn't really like, wasn't really playing. And then, yeah, the next thing you know, Hey everybody, raw power, here we go. <laughs> and, and then, but I saw, um, so he did a warm up show with some dudes I know in San Jose, uh, which is not Stooges sounding band at all. And it was a trip to like watch and see, uh, you know, after like the, you know, the first, like maybe like first half a song, like kind of like he's still sort of getting his bearings. And then like, once he locked in, it's like, Christ, there it is. It's like him. It's like there's, he didn't miss a beat, you know? Yeah. I mean, but his, his style was great. And, and then I, of course, Ron was a great guitarist as well, but, uh, different the, vibes, the, the, but the, the, the first, four records, I mean, and Kill City, too, are all so different from one another. And a lot of Diggy's solo stuff is as well. Like, I I love uh, New Values and um, fucking, uh, God, what's the one? The Idiot? Oh, oh, of course, The Idiot. Yeah, I mean, you know, The Idiot, fucking, um, uh, the one with the track, uh, the, not the one with butt down, right? <laughs> Lust for Life. Um, no, um, God, this is a more obscure one. What the fuck, man? I can't believe I can't think of the name of it. Oh, uh, got the horse song on it, The Villagers. It was one record he did oh. where, where his co writing partner was a keyboard player. And it's an amazing record, but it's one, it's so, you know, it's like so off the radar of his shit. It's one of the greatest records ever. And New Values was an amazing record. Um, really minimal. And I think that was the first time Williamson played with him since the Stooges and just played on a couple songs, maybe. But, yeah, uh, yeah, that's that sounds right. Uh, yeah, God, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to think of what that record is now. I'm totally like escaping me. I'm actually. I, I could totally see the cover. He's sitting like in some Caribbean, like. You know, like outside some Caribbean restaurant or is it Zombie Birdhouse? Is that yes, Zombie Birdhouse? There we go. That's it. Jesus, you got it. <laughs> the, Fuck, I know. The I former record I store clerk in me comes out. <laughs> this, this is part of getting old, man. Like shit that I, you know, like I, I might see Robert De Niro on TV and go, "What? What's that guy's name again?" <laughs> <laughs> Well, better to forget Zombie Birdhouse than like your address or something, you know. What I mean? <laughs> like if you're talking about security, yeah, <laughs> you have to knock on someone's door. Excuse me, do you know where I live? Oh, Christ. <laughs> <laughs> Wandering around the neighborhood in my diaper. I'm lost. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, how? Hey was... man. Yep. I got. You gotta, gotta get going. This up. Yeah, I got. I've got. I'm in the middle of this fucking heavy duty job, and my wife is 
on my case because she's engineering it for me. So I got to get going. All good, brother. Really appreciate the time. Thanks so much for uh, for taking time out to do it. And uh, it's been great talking to you, man. I really enjoyed it. Take care. All right, brother. There he goes. Mr. Mark Lanigan. Let's hear a song. Cracks in a ceiling Crooked pictures in the hall Counting and breathing I'm leaving here tomorrow
the end of day And twilight falls again To the funny sound That a blackbird makes Twilight falls again As no good reason remains I'll do the same Thinking of you One day ship comes in One day ship comes in But I can't say how or when But I know somewhere A ship comes in every day There is no more pain, I'm only sleeping There is no climb to dreams like this And if you could take something with you You'd be right Something good From my fingertips The cigarette Grows ashes to the ground I'd stop and talk to the girls Who work this street But I got business farther down Like one long season of rain I will remain Thinking of you One day ship comes in From far away ship comes in One hundred days you wait for it And you know somewhere Ship comes in every day There is no more pain I'm always sleeping There is no crime to dreams like this And if you could take something with you It would be bright Like something good One day ship comes in One hundred days You wait for it Something bright Something so good In the Fade by Queens of the Stone Age, featuring vocals by Mr. Mark Lanigan, uh, the proton controversial guest for today. Then we had, as a wild change of in mood, uh, off the record Hawk, which is the collaboration with uh, Isabel Campbell. We had Snake Song, great tune. And then 100 Days off of the Bubblegum record. Another good one. So here's... Another tune by Mr. Lanigan. Uh, I favor the Blues Funeral record quite a bit, as I mentioned earlier. 
let's listen to Harborview Hospital. <music>
We had a rock block there. We had a Harbor View Hospital. And then that was Gutter Twins with uh, Idle Hands. All right. So, I would lo- once again, like to Can you thank my that? guest, Mr. Mark Lanigan. Uh, MarkLanigan.com, L A N E G A N. The new record is called Somebody's Knocking. And you can buy it, you can stream it, all the things that you normally do. Uh, Europe. Dates are posted on our site. He's got the UK, France, uh, Italy, all kinds of stuff. He keeps it very busy. Uh, he is an excellent follow on follow on Twitter, where he is at Mark Lanigan. <laughs> Shockingly so. Uh, what else? Anything? Anything else? Yeah, just um, you know. Check out the new record. Uh, oh, definitely check out the video. Videos uh, for the new record are up on YouTube. Uh, the great feature, the great Jim the Cab Driver, and uh, who's a uh, Donnell? Donnell Logue. Logue? L O G U E. I don't know. Signing off. Yeah. Mr. and Mrs. America. 
Good talk. Feel good about that one. That was that was that was, uh, that was awesome. Sometimes you never quite know where these things are gonna go. It's a, it's a tough dude. <laughs> I thought that was gonna go one or two ways. I thought it went all right. I've got fifty thousand watts of power. Name of the show is Kona Neutron's Protonic Reversal. This happens every Thursday, eight p.m. Eastern, seven p.m. Central, six p.m. Mountain, five p.m. Pacific. Here on Radio Nope, RadioNope.com, RadioNeutron.com for the archives. Let people know about the show, please. Uh, rate it on iTunes, Stitcher, uh, Spotify. Share it. Share it around, please. Don't keep it a secret. We have no sponsors. We don't, you don't get charged for this. Everything helps. All right, plenty more rad stuff coming up. Take it easy. I got my radio on. Can you hear me now? to my top 10. I'd like to thank our sponsor. But we haven't got a sponsor. Not if you were the last man on earth. She was prepared to prove it. This one goes out to a special girl. There is no special girl! It's the... It's the end of radio! The last announcer plays the last record! The last what? Leaves the transmitter! Circles the globe in search of a listener. Can you hear me now? Broadcasting if there's no one there to receive. It's the end of radio. As we come to the close of our broadcast day.
Radio. Can you hear me now? the crickets and I was like huh I opened up my fucking door my room is not filled with crickets but it's filled with like locusts <laughs> my, my fucking hotel room and beans were filled with these gigantic grasshoppers oh man 